Okay, everyone, so this is the second part of our poetry lecture, and we talked a little bit before about speaker, about the form that poems take with stanzas and lines, um, and a little bit about how to read a poem, as well as some of the things that make poems different from prose and from drama. So if you haven't watched that lecture, it's about 15, 16 minutes long, and I'd like you to see that one before you see this one. Here we're going to focus on sound, so things like rhythm, meter, and rhyme. I love this picture here on the left. It's like, oh, it captures poetry like in a picture. I love it. Rhythm, our little drum there, <laughs> the beat created by the sounds of the words in the poem. Now, I'm going to talk in a minute about meter, and meter can sometimes be very difficult to detect. So we're not going to do, um, well, well, we'll talk about that in a moment, but rhythm can be created by meter, but it can also be created by other things like rhyme, alliteration, refrain, that's a part that repeats, um, motif if we have a repeated element, and also when we get into spoken word poetry, the performance. So the performance of how people decide to speed something up and then slow it on down, um, they're creating the rhythm just by how they're performing the poem. This is from a poem that you'll be reading for homework, and then we'll return to Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening, which we looked at in our last lecture. This is The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe. Keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 bells from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Now, hopefully when you, and maybe you can hear me tapping away, um, but you can hear the rhythm there, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically wells, um, the, the beat that he creates to keep that time, um, runic rhyme meaning like, you know, dong, 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 you can hear the ringing of the bells in the the poem itself and that is the sound effect that he's trying to create now with each type of bell when you get into this poem each type of bell has a different meaning so we'll look at the golden wedding bells the silver sleigh bells are first then the golden wedding bells then the alarm bells of brass and then the iron bells um, that ring when people are um, going to have a funeral oops there we go so meter, this is um, an example of someone doing what is known as scansion. Scansion is determining what the meter of the poem is. I'm not going to be requiring you to do this, um, but you can see here that the little high mark, sometimes it's, sometimes it's drawn like this and sometimes it's drawn like this. Oh, whoops, <laughs> not quite. Let's erase that. Um, sometimes it's drawn as a straight line, which I will attempt. There we go. That's the stressed syllable. And then the unstressed is a little dip like a U. So all the things we hide in water. Water. We emphasize in water this part and we de-emphasize the er sound when we say it. So the way that we pronounce things is really what um, what meter means, the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables. Here in this short poem, all the things we hide in water, hoping we won't see them go. Forest growing underwater, press against the ones we know. Now, there's a weird thing going on here because most of these are da da up, down, up, down, up, down, hoping. Now, I would mark this as we like that, which is one of the reasons I don't have you do scansion because it's, it's weird. Hoping we won't see them go. Da, 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 da. They, maybe they marked it wrong because it should be like that. They kind of messed up here. And there's there's not two syllables in won't either, right? So we have one, two, three, four. Um, the fourth one here is just, uh, 
just uh, emphasized the stressed syllable. And that's really what meter is referring to. It occurs when stressed and unstressed syllables of words in a poem are arranged in a repeating pattern. So like I said up here, they marked this wrong. And I don't know if that was on purpose to teach meter when I got this picture. But you can see it's a stressed and then an unstressed repeated three times and then a stressed and unstressed here and then a stressed and unstressed here and then a stressed and a stressed. So that's the that's the pattern um, Four feet in each line. That's what one of these is called the stressed and then unstressed. It's called a foot. So when poets write in meter, they count the number of syllables that are stressed, strong syllables, and unstressed that are weak syllables. And then they try to repeat the pattern throughout the poem. Not in all poetry. <laughs> Some poetry has no meter, and we'll talk about that too, or it has what's called an irregular meter. When we get to the goblin market, which you're doing for your final project, um, if you're in the summer class at least, um, the... The Goblin Market has an irregular meter to it. So here's another poem where it's broken up into metric feet. Foot is a unit of meter. A foot can have one to four syllables, but usually contains at least one stressed and at least one or more unstressed syllables. Sometimes it can just be one stressed, um, but usually it's a stressed and an unstressed somewhere in there. So this is from a Shakespearean poem, and we have unstressed and stressed, one, two, three, four, and five. That's the pattern, 10 syllables total, five feet, with an unstressed and then a stressed. The types of feet are determined by the arrangement. And I have them listed here. You know, it, we're going to talk about the other one that's in um, Goblin Market isn't listed here. Iambic pentameter is what we just saw. Five feet pent, penta means five, like a pentagram, five pointed star, right? Um, I am is then an unstressed followed by a stressed. So it would look like that. Um, trochaic, which we just saw in the other one, was the stressed and then the unstressed, so the opposite of the I am. Um, anapestic is unstressed, unstressed, stressed. Dactylic is stressed, unstressed, unstressed. I actually think the dactyl is the one that's in uh, Goblin Market now that I think of it. So here's the thing. <laughs> um, if you're in a different class, you might need to know this and you might be doing scansion, which it should be Nope, that's just an example. Um, but for my class, I just want you to have the terminology. Um, this is an introduction to literature course. So if you go on to other courses, if you take a poetry class, they'll probably teach you how to do scansion. At least you'll have some of the terms before you kind of move to that level. And then if you take a creative writing class, they might have you write in a specific meter. They might say, write a poem that's in iams, or write a poem that is has trochaes, or write a poem that has some kind of meter. Um, so again, I just want you to know the terms here for our purposes. When we're determining meter, uh, here is, again, a process of determining meter is called scansion. It's the act of scanning a line and determining its rhythm. Versification is another term. Um, versification occurs when a particular metrical structure or style is used in a poem. So here in Stopping by the Woods, you can see how this is already broken up into feet. One, two, three, and four. Okay. And one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. As you can see, broken up to feet, four feet in each line. Each foot is an I am. It's unstressed and then stressed. Now, here, does the meter make a difference in the meaning? Maybe, because he's supposed to be on a horse. And if you think about how horses go, unstressed and then stressed. Bump, 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 bump. That's how a horse kind of goes. Uh, think about Monty Python with the coconuts, if you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, I feel very old. But anyway, um, whose woods these are, I think I know. 
Woulds, are, think, know. Those have the stress syllables on them. And we get this lilting, feeling as if he is possibly traveling on horseback or in a, uh, in a sleigh, rather, while the horse goes on. So we have this repetition of four lines in the poem, four stanzas, four um, feet per line, which is kind of interesting. Doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the meaning. Um, four repeated that way. Um, this is um, iambic tetrameter, it's called, when we have four. Pentameter, again, is five. Um, but kind of interesting. And the letters on the side there we're going to talk about in a moment. So free verse poetry, I'd like you to know this term. Unlike metered poetry, free verse does not have any repeating patterns of stressed or unstressed syllables, and it does not have rhyme. Free verse is sometimes conversational and a more contemporary type of poem. Thunder rolls from booming clouds hanging overhead, growling like black dogs, flashing brilliant white fangs. There's, there's a little bit of meter in the beginning and then it changes it's irregular there's no meter that stays through the whole poem and most um poems that i see uh with exception of spoken word but it's spoken word sort of influenced by music so um a lot of poems that i see today don't really have a meter and i think it's because sometimes when we have a meter in contemporary poetry it sounds a little bit forced so a lot of poets kind of move away from that to have a little bit more freedom of expression not good or bad just different blank verse poetry sometimes people get mixed up with free verse but blank verse has iambic pentameter so there is a definite rhythm but there's no end rhyme um this is from a play but it's a prose it's dramatic prose meaning he's writing um in or, i'm sorry he's <laughs> dramatic poetry he's writing it like a poem even though it's a it's a play if you read um Romeo and Juliet, when they first meet, they talk to each other in a sonnet. Anyway, cowards die many times before the, their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I have, that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. There's a definite rhythm here, but there's no um, rhyme at the end. So blank verse versus free verse. Free verse is just does whatever it wants. Blank verse just doesn't have rhyme. So rhyme, I feel like I don't really have to explain basic rhyme, words that sound alike because they share the same and vowel and ending consonant sounds. So lamp, stamp, damp, camp, all of those words rhyme because they have the AMP at the end, just different consonants at the beginning. Consonants are any letter that's not A, E, I, O, U. And sometimes Y is a consonant, sometimes it's a vowel. Poor Y, the unwanted child of the family. Other types of rhyme. So internal rhyme occurs when a word inside a line rhymes with another word inside that same line or sometimes in another line. And um, we'll look at sometimes there's some poems that do this that we'll be looking at. Near rhyme is when we have imperfect or close rhyme. How now cow is perfect rhyme, meaning we have the OW and all that changes is this first letter. Brown cow spout is imperfect rhyme. We have assonance, which I'll talk about later, of this ow sound, but spout and cow don't really rhyme. They just sort of sound the same. Um, this is used a lot of times in music, too, you know, when people want to sort of rhyme but not be really forced into it. A rhyme scheme is where we're looking at this third type of rhyme called end rhyme. End rhyme is when the word at the end of a line rhymes with a word at the end of another line. Rhyme scheme is a pattern of rhyme using the letters of the alphabet to visually see the pattern. So the example that I gave you before, um, A, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C. So this has been marked out for us. So no rhymes with though and snow. Okay. Here, 
does not rhyme with no in those, so it gets a B. This starts our pattern, this breaks it up. Then queer and near rhyme with here. And then lake, again, breaks that pattern, so it gets a C. So, I just said all that. So looking at the full rhyme scheme, you can see an interlocking pattern. This is sometimes called chain rhyme. In the last stanza, um, this breaks the pattern and we just get D, 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 D. And again, this might mean something, but it might not. It might just be the way that the poet decided to write this poem, to have maybe a, a larger, more important conclusion with the repetition of the last line, with all of the words rhyming, perhaps. But it's important to know and to be able to identify the rhyme scheme because it is something we're going to be talking about quite a bit later. Unlike scansion and meter, which really I just sort of wanted to introduce to you, rhyme scheme is something I'd like you to be able to know and identify. Oh, here, just as another example, we have what are called rhyming couplets. Rhyming couplets occur when two lines, the end rhyme of two lines rhyme. So a mighty creature is the germ, though smaller than a pachyderm. His customary dwelling place is deep within the human race. His childish pride he often pleases by giving people strange diseases. Do you, my poppet, feel infirm? You probably contain a germ. This is kind of a, a, a humorous little poem, um, though I think true. <laughs> but we've got these um, exact perfect rhyme. Germ, pachyderm are a little bit more imperfect because of the extra syllable. But place and race pleases, diseases, infirm, germ. Again, because the extra syllable kind of near rhyme as opposed to place and race. But... Um, Rhyming couplets, nevertheless. Two lines coming together. Oh, there we go. A, A, B, B, C, C, and then A and A again. So um, it sort of completes the circle of life in a way. Um, infirm and germ. Um, germ repeating the beginning and the end, um, which is interesting to me. Okay. Okay. Some other sound effects. Onomatopoeia, words that imitate the sound that they are naming. Buzz, beep, bam, boom, pow. Um, the buzzing of the honeybee. If we say buzz, that's the sound that he's making. This is a poem called Running Water. Water plops into pond, splish, splash, downhill. Warbling magpies in tree, trilling melodic trill. Whoosh, passing breeze, flags flutter and flap, frogs croak, bird whistles, babbling bubbles from tap. It's by Lee Emmett from uh, Australia. But I think it's just so interesting. Plop, splish, splash, warbling, trilling, whoosh, flutter, croak, whistle, babbling, and bubbles. Um, all of those words give such great imagery and also kind of tickle our ears a little bit. Alliteration. Alliteration occurs when consonant sounds are at the beginning of words. So Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. How many pe pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, this is from the Snowy Wood poem. So he gives his harness bells a shake. His harness, that's the repeated consonant there, H and H. To ask if there is some mistake, the only other sounds, the sweep, of easy wind and downy flake. We've got sort of alliteration here, broken up by the the, but close enough, right? So two places in stopping by the woods on a snowy evening where we have alliteration and they both take place in that same stanza. Consonants is similar to alliteration, except that the repeated consonant sounds can be anywhere in the words. So silken, sad, uncertain, rustling, t -t 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 <laughs> uncertain and rustling are in the middle of the words but it creates consonants here is an example um, this is by Edgar Allan Poe it's an excerpt from The Sleeper at midnight in the month of June I stand beneath the mystic moon an opiate vapor dewy dim 
exhales out of her golden rim and softly dripping drop by drop upon the quiet mountaintop steals drowsily and musically into the universal valley. So in a couple places here, mystic moon, dewy dim, um, dripping drop drop, those are examples of alliteration. Here with universal valley, we get the Vs. This one is in the middle, and so therefore it is an example of consonants. Very similar. Assonance is kind of a uh, cousin. To it. <laughs> it's related to consonants. Consonance happens when we repeat a consonant sound. Um, anything but a vowel, if you remember. So assonance is a repeated vowel sound in a line of poetry, sort of like I talked about before, brown cow and spout, right? Often creates near rhyme because of that. Lake fate base fade all have a long A sound. They don't rhyme, but it almost sounds like it because they're all one syllable long and they all have that long A. The slow Slow the low gradual moan came in the snowing. It's from a poem by John Maysfield. Oh, 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 and oh. We have that repeated. And it really is meant to sound like that moan. Oh, like a ghost. <laughs> the cat ran after the alligator past the pastry shop and the alleyway. Ah, 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 ah. Assonance, the repeated short A there. Um, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and you notice that the A in pastry does not count, and neither does the A in way for alleyway. Alley, past, alligator, and cat ran after. All of those have that short A sound. So that's it for this lecture. Um, we're going to pick back up with types of poetry because I think that there's a lot of terms here for you to learn um, and didn't want to make this too long. So I will see you again in that lecture. Thanks.